Welcome to Six Pack Philosophy, where we take philosophy, mix it with beer, and apply it to the questions you deal with every day. Welcome to Six Pack Philosophy. I'm Anastasia here with Mike and John, and this week we're discussing supreme justice. Supreme justice. But before we get started, what are we drinking, guys? We are drinking Fire Ant Funeral Amber L. By the Texas L Project in Dallas, Texas. Mm. Um, I like the I like the look of this one anyway. I, y'all sent me to the refrigerator. I said, "What kind of beer? Which beer are we drinking?" And John said, "Just pick one of them." And I like the the way the fire ant funeral sounded and looked on this yeah. hot day. So, uh, yeah, look, fuck fire ants. Fuck fire ants. Let's see. And what was it? A and M that cursed us with them. We don't talk bad about about the Aggies. We don't talk bad about the Aggies. But that is the thing that happened, right? I don't know that that's right? true. No, okay. No, it may be. It may be. Yeah, I thought I it was. Uh, that, that, I hope not. I hope not. Look into it. We'll talk Change about where it. my money goes, if that's the case. Uh-oh. I try not to talk bad about the Aggies, because that means I'm talking about the Aggies. <laughs> oh, John. Lord, Lord, so, Lord, Lord. anyway. All right, so we are uh, talking about, you know, uh, specifically yes. the uh, retirement of Justice Kennedy. But a little bit broader idea of, you know, what does it mean when the you know this great swing vote retires? Right. Uh, and and I, I want to look at uh, at Trump's nominee to replace him, and I want to look at some key justices of the past. So maybe we can put some perspective on this stuff. Um, that sound good to you guys? Yeah, let's that do it. Sounds fantastic. All right. So Justice Kennedy, uh, he's been there a long time. In fact, he's the longest serving active member of the Supreme Court. Uh, Longest currently serving or longest ever serving? No, no, longest currently serving. Okay. Uh, but he, he's up there in the running for the longest serving. He was appointed by Ronald Reagan in 1988. So he's I'm been there. the ancient, notorious RBG hasn't served longer. He's no. been there since I was born. I was born in 1988. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so Justice Kennedy was appointed then. It's a long time. And it's an interesting, uh, it's an interesting position. He, he came on the court about the same time Sandra Day O'Connor had come on. They're, 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 they're within a couple of years of each other. And those two were always the swing votes. They were the two that, that, that you couldn't predict what was going to happen. With the uh, retirement of Sandra Day O'Connor several years back, Justice Kennedy became the, the most important voice on the court. Now, he's not a chief justice. Right. But if you ever watch the cases that are argued before it, the cases for the last 20 years have largely been tailored to Kennedy mm -hmm. because there were four liberals, there were four conservatives. You knew basically how they were going to vote. And, then there and was this however guy. Kennedy was swayed was kind of the way the court went. Right. Now, let me ask for the, yeah. for the distinction. Uh, and, and my understanding is, but you know better, uh, that it's not that important. You mentioned he's not a chief justice. What's the difference in a justice and a chief justice? There, there is no, no difference in voting rights. The difference is the chief justice is the person that uh, that assigns the uh, assigns who writes the majority opinion, assigns who writes the official minority opinion. But all the judges are free to write whatever they want. Okay. Uh, so so it's kind of like the chair of the court. It is. It is a very important position because the person that writes that majority opinion is 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 writing the precedent that, that's going to govern the nation for, you know, until the until the court decides to overturn itself. Uh, but. This guy, Justice Kennedy, he, he was kind of a surprise. When Reagan put him on, people expected him to be a staunch, staunch conservative. Right. Um, and, 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 and he has been in a lot of ways. There's, there are some things that, that Kennedy's been, been, been very conservative on. He, uh, uh, he continuously votes against gun control. In fact, he, uh, he, was, he was one of the votes to try and, 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 and get rid of the Washington, D.C. handgun law. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't own a handgun in D.C. He voted against that. Uh, now, he lost that. Uh, but, but, but he voted against that decision. Um, but at the same time he does that, he's also the author of every modern decision when it comes to homosexual rights and marriage. He wrote the, the decisions that, that overturned uh, uh, the, 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 uh, uh, the, the gay sex preventions. Mm -hmm. This is that guy. So he's been a uh, he, he's very hard for people to get a grip on with, with what he's doing. Um, Kennedy loves guns and gays. What does that uh, sound like? Kennedy uh. also is kind of a strange character because he uh, he he has been very much uh, for a woman's right to have an abortion. Yeah. Yet he, he wrote the decision uh, or the minority decision against the uh, uh, the ban on partial birth abortion with, the, with this stuff. So he's for abortion, but he went back and he said, but if a state decides to ban partial birth abortions, it's not the federal government's authority. 
Right. It's you, you know so so he's he's kind of a strange strange person. He's um, he says there has to be a line, but he gives the states some latitude to draw. He does. The line. He gives the states quite a bit of, of, of latitude. When it came to the Bush administration, who people again expected him to be this 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 person that would back the Bush administration because Reagan appointee, right? Uh, he is. He was the deciding vote that came through and said that prisoners of war held at Gitmo at Guantanamo Bay had a right to habeas corpus. That that they had constitutional rights. That's something that that surprised a lot of people. It it, it was it, it was quite shocking yeah. uh, that he does this. Um, so by lose when you lose this voice on the court, you're losing a balance. Okay. And, and I, I wonder exactly what that's going to do to the court. Well, you know, and I'm, I'm at a really weird place because he, you know a lot more about the justice than I do. Um, but from what I hear, I, I, I kind of like this guy, right? He's, he's a uh, – they. I, I was reading where a, a Harvard, a Harvard uh, professor, and I've forgotten what his name was, said that this was the most libertarian Supreme Court justice we've ever had. Right. And that was his opinion. Yeah. But – but I also like, and this, you know, this kind of goes into the, the, the whole paradox of a group who wants to get into government to reduce it are really bad at getting into government because they don't want to play that game. Yeah. He is retiring, right? He is. Which is a bad political move, but I like that he's doing it. He's saying, I have served my time. It is now someone else's turn. The fact that someone does that makes me like them, but I hate that he's do does that make any sense? You wish sense? it was somebody who you liked less. It's yes. interesting to me though that, that that he, you know, they were expecting him to retire during the Obama administration, and he held off until there was a Republican there. Right. Uh, now, now that shouldn't surprise us, I guess, that he because he was a. Uh, I mean, that's you know, standard a, practice. He was, but, but, well, well, it, it's kind of surprising because in all reality. The Obama administration was much more moderate, I think, than the Trump administration has been so far, and he seems to be a pretty moderate guy. Right. Uh, but but again, he was he was a Republican appointee. Um, he he did make he did make one decision that or vote on one decision that I, I have a little bit of an issue with um, on the uh, um, uh, Citizens United case. He's one of the ones that voted in support of unlimited spending by PACs. Uh, now, and now, now his statement was the reason why is because, and, and, and I kind of agree with him that spending is, is speech. Mm-hmm. Uh, but but it, it makes me it makes me, I'm in a weird place there where I don't want people spending unlimited. But I think he's right on the on, on the constitutionality of it. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? And we're losing that voice. And think about it. This will be the this will be the second appointee that Trump's had. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I've that's heard, a lot of influence. Well, when and- Gorsuch came in. Gorsuch has, 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 is showing all the signs of being an uber-conservative judge. I've heard some really interesting arguments on that, and I don't actually know where I fall. I, I've fallen on one side or the other of that issue as I've progressed. Um, but a really interesting argument that spending, enormous spending in campaigns, is critical to third parties and independents because the incumbent always has a large value worth of publicity in his position. And the yeah. only way to overcome that is egregious spending to, to overpower that. And if you remove that, you've not removed this huge advantage. You've just removed the ability to overturn it. Yeah. I, I can see that. However, it is, it is almost impossible for a third-party candidate to raise and spend more money than an incumbent. Yeah, you know, it it it, it it's something that, that that's very difficult unless you have a you know an independently wealthy can like a Ross Perot that was able to touch, right. spend his own money over and over. Yeah, again. yeah. Uh, so it's it's kind of an interesting idea here. Here's a question before we get into the next one. I, I kind of want to want to throw something out here because there's two schools of thought about justices. Before we get into the appointee, mm-hmm. there are those that believe that we should appoint only. Non-biased judges that are, you know, that that are that are moderate and and seem open to all ideas, mm-hmm. which is, you know, the majority. But there's a whole school out there that says no, we should be appointing highly partisan, highly politicized judges, and the idea being that since presidents overturn or are, are, are presidents, presidential parties overturn, you'll end up with a court that accurately. Um, 
reflects the will of the people. And by having the polar opposites argue, you end up with a better decision. Here's here's my problem with that. And, and, and I, I could agree with that if we had a 30 or 50 man judge panel. The problem is we don't. We have a nine man, yes. Yeah, so with of nine people, if you have two judges retire under one president, that was maybe one term in a very liberal scope of, yeah. of, of you know, very conservative president in a very liberal scope of America yeah. on the long yeah. haul. They can reshape the court for a long time well, yeah, because it happened. For 30 years. It happened. Yeah. This one, I mean, there's such a swing there. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, there, there is. There is. But 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 I understand the logic here of of you know I I want somebody there that has firm beliefs that is going to argue those firm beliefs uh, because I, I want to hear the argument. I, I think it should be out there with but, an argument. But I think that's a flawed view of the courts because you're already saying that the referee should be arguing their beliefs, and I think the referee should not be arguing their beliefs. I think that's what. That's what uh, uh, Roberts did when, when he gave the argument to yeah. Obamacare. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, they're tasked with determining constitutionality. And that should not be partisan. The lawyers should be partisan, not yeah. the judges. Well, yeah, and, and, and I, I hate to say partisan, uh, but, but, but I, I think there's I think there's a... I don't think you can argue the Constitution without arguing ideology at the very least. Yeah. Because either your ideology is... Uh, uh, you know, a uh, highly structured, limited government, or your ideology is this loose construction that it's whatever the Constitution's. You, you know, does well, does the no. Constitution mean what it says, or does the Constitution mean you can do anything it doesn't say you can't well, do? N- you can have a philosophy on um, what it means to determine the constitutionality of something that has absolutely nothing to do with your political beliefs. Um, in fact, I, I think agree. we saw that with Scalia. Or, or, no, it wasn't Scalia. There was some guy. Fuck, now I can't remember who it was. There was one of them who, um, on more than one occasion, was like, look, like politically, I don't like coming down on this side. Um, Kennedy's that way a when lot. when you look at the the constitutionality of it this is what it says and it's like that doesn't well, that doesn't come down to what i believe uh politically and it was, hurts my side politically that but that was kennedy's argument on abortion well and i'm fine with a variety of philosophical views but i don't think that translates to a variety of political views yeah. I, I agree i you agree know. yeah i agree so the uh, appointee who uh, who has Trump put up to replace Kennedy? Tell us a little a little bit about him, John. Yeah, so so he's put up this gentleman named uh, Brett. Uh, you have to help me with the last name because Kavanaugh. You, Kavanaugh. I was half expecting Cruz. Yeah. I don't know why. I just like I had no. this thought at one point. I was like, the guy Watch he's been mother. arguing with the whole time. Well, the only and reason, he's been sucking his dick ever well, since. Part of the reason some people expected him to be appointed was it takes him out of the running for the presidency. Next also time. that. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm going to give a little bit of the history of how he got to a position to be appointed. And then once we go through that, I want to go through some of his arguments and how he's kind of cited on issues uh, in the past. So uh, uh, he, he kind of first got his name uh, when he started making really strong arguments from the bench. Uh, and... and uh, forgive me, I don't remember which bench this was uh, for the impeachment of Clinton. He was yeah. he was highly involved in that, a big name in that. Um, he also uh, argued once in front of the SCOTUS. Uh, he lost his case, but his argument he was arguing on the side of, and I don't know how much we can judge somebody on what side they argued, but it is interesting. He was asking the SCOTUS to disregard uh, attorney-client privileges in this case for some reason i didn't go into the details of the case so it's it's a interesting view that i think is going to tie into some of his other things later on um he later in bush's campaign secured a, a job as an assistant to the president and white house staff secretary so he's highly involved in bush's campaign probably on the coattails of the impeachment yeah yeah um and from that he gets an appointment from bush uh, to one of the lower courts, and this appointment gets held up for three years by the Democrats due to accusations of partisanship. When he finally is appointed, it's straight along party lines, which, you Shocker. know, when you see that and you see these accusations of strong partisanship, on the one hand, I want to say, yeah, that's every appointee ever. 
And on the other hand, I want to say, if you look at his history and how he's been involved, there does kind of seem to be some strong yeah. leanings there. Yeah. Um, so, let's get into some of his views. He is very strong against abortion. In fact, he lauded uh, a... a um, Ruling that was held down, that that was handed, or, or uh, sorry, not a ruling. It was a minority opinion that was handed down, that uh, basically said if we are going to recognize a right to an abortion, the only place I can find that is in the history and traditions of our country. And looking at the history of abortion, I don't find that history to be there to uphold abortion rights. So the only place I can find your right to abortion is we've done it, but we hadn't been doing it, so you can't do it now. Yeah. Yeah. Uh and I, I understand where he's coming from. If yeah. you're looking at a constitutional argue, argument, I understand where he's coming from. Whether you agree with it or not, it, it, it's hard to find that spot in there. He also argued really heavily in an actual case. He ends up uh, uh, getting overturned. He, his ruling was a pe- was was his ruling went through. Let me say that because he was on a panel, uh, but then it gets overturned at, at the higher courts. I don't exactly know how to word that, but he was arguing against, uh, and you'll probably remember this case, but there was an immigrant who was coming in, they were pregnant, they wanted an abortion, they were being held in detention, and they were being denied an abortion, yeah. and the argument was, can you force her to have this baby, um, you know, she would be able to have an abortion in her home country, and you're kind of forcing her there, uh, she ends up having an abortion, and the whole thing gets overturned, as well as... Uh, they, uh, what's the word called, uh, they, they, in Injunctive relief, I think it's called, where they said, "Yeah, go ahead, let her have the abortion while the case goes through, and you're wrong." So yeah. that they, they, they kind of lost on 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 both ends of that. Um, he, so there was a, a case that came before the lower courts on the ACA. This is the one that made it to the Supreme Court, and the court actually rules that we can't hear this case in the ACA. It's out of our jurisdiction. Um, he actually writes the dissenting opinion against the idea. Um, and his argument for why they could hear the ACA was he called it a tax, which I think becomes very interesting later when it's ruled constitutional based on being a yeah. tax. Yeah. So, you know, a, a after, bit of... After arguing that it's not a tax. Yeah. Right, right. And so that's why it couldn't be heard um, uh, in the lower courts because they were saying it wasn't a tax, yeah. and that's how it's passed. So I think that's mm. interesting. Um there were a few cases uh, environmentally, uh, one in which he, there was this nuclear waste uh, storage plant that was going in. Um, the uh, Environmental Protection Agency was refusing to issue a license. They said, you know, it's no good. And he came through and um, ordered them to start issuing license and to issue license to this, this plant. Um, I don't really want to comment there on whether that means he's strong anti-environmentalist because I don't know the details of the case. And there's many cases yeah. in which I could, I could see that going either way. Uh, but he was also against the, the, uh, the Clean Air Act. He actually tried to strike it down. The SCOTUS overruled him in that. Um, so depending on where you stand on environmental protection. He's been overturned a lot of times, though. He has. Yeah. He yeah. has. Um, which isn't surprising when you see the makeup of the court whenever he was, uh, you know, was arguing these cases. Yeah, uh, there was he while he was on the lower courts, uh, his panel refused to hear a challenge to net neutrality. He dissented on that and said they should hear the the challenge to net neutrality. So he's against net new. It seems he's against net neutrality and wanted to hear that. Um, or at least wanted to hear the case. Yeah, yeah. I was going to say, I'll, I'll be fair there. Like, there are plenty of things that I didn't necessarily agree with that I wanted to hear out. Yeah. Well, yeah. And, and I think that's a, a disclaimer we need to put on all these. Even yeah. even with his abortion and, and his strong uh, uh, lauding of that opinion, uh, until you're there and you actually have time, which we don't on this show, to go through each of these cases and hear all the details, there might have been a perfectly valid reason on any of these. why. Yeah, yeah. But it, it may give you a little bit of a hint. But, but there seems to be a pattern here. Yeah. Right, yeah. right. Um, let's see. Net neutrality. Um so, th- and this is getting a little bit more into the, the depths of his personality. Uh, this this person, Jonathan Turley, who I didn't know who he was, but apparently yeah. someone worth quoting, um, stated that among the judges considered by Trump, uh, Kavanaugh, is that, am I saying yeah. that right? Kavanaugh. Nah. Kavanaugh. Uh, has the most robust... So, this is a little scary to me. Uh, 
Kavanaugh has the most robust view of presidential powers and immunities. Uh, and f- that that seems to be you know because that they fits. know where this is going. Well, it, it fits with the, the the previous appointees. Yeah. Well, and and he even went so far in, in one of his papers to write that uh, uh, give very strong opinion on the fact or the opinion that the president is immune from prosecution while in office. Yeah, that Richard Nixon tried that too, and the court at that point overturned it. Well, I think it's a new court. It's yeah, a new court. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, God, I hope that with the, two people who got their jobs from the guy who's yeah. yeah. Um, you were talking. You were talking a little bit about Gitmo. Um, he argued. Uh, he's argued strongly against rights for terrorists, rights for immigrants. Uh, he was in favor of the it's mass humans who aren't American, right? Yes, more or less. Uh, argued in favor of the mass data collection program as being constitutional. Um, he. He has, on many occasions, rejected foreign entities' right to sue. One was a pharmaceutical company that the government came out and was making these claims that they were a terrorist organization. They came back and tried to sue the government, saying it was liable. There was no terror, terrorist uh, activity going on. They're a pharmaceutical company. And he rejected their, he refused their right to sue the government. He refused to hear it. So that gives you any insights onto those. That's, that's terrifying. Yeah. Um, he he seems to be really strong on Second Amendment rights, uh, cutting uh, striking down many states' bans and local bans on on gun ownership. Um, and in a review of Good. him, yeah. Um, so they Not were looking federal overreach at the D.C. Circuit no, judges. But, no, because you, there, there is a, there is a federal right. In the Constitution, to to own firearms, it's not overreach for the federal government to uh, to say that states can't limit a right that's outlined by the federal government. So the, the, there was an analysis done of the um, D.C. Circuit judges uh, on how conservative they are. He was uh, listed fifth out of eleven on conservatism. Well, right in the middle. Yeah, yeah, pretty close. Um, and he was also in that same article recognized as a stalwart originalist. Oh dear God! So oh, dear God, you don't like an originalist? I, I, I do to an extent, but I, but I'm looking at at the things that the things that he has said there, and when you put originalist in with that, it can be scary. It can be very terrible. Elaborate like how? Well, because you, you think about. If you're interpreting the doc, you're talking about a document that was written in a time period when women had few rights, when when blacks had few rights, when property was restricted, and it's you know the, the particularly his Gitmo positions make me a little worried about about, about being an interpreter in uh, at, you know from the original intent. Um, I think original intent is a great thing, but I think it's a great thing if you're already a moderate. Does that make any sense? Okay. It, it's a little terrifying to me. Uh, I, so think either, I think either is... position can be bent so badly. And I think where his position is, it is easier to get where he is if you're an originalist. So, so you're saying that original intent can be interpreted in numerous ways. Yeah, yeah, I think so. So I think at this point, we, we kind of have a little bit of a history on Kennedy. We kind of have a little bit on Kavanaugh. Ah, oh. Kavanaugh. Sorry, that's a tough name to read. Um, the views. Do you want to talk a little bit about the beer? Talk about the beer, and then about we'll get back to the uh, beer. To, then we'll get back to the judges. Okay. Well, yep. I guess Anna I'll gets start. to start this one. So I really like this beer. What are we drinking? For what? For what it is? We are drinking Fire Ant Funeral. By the Texas L Project in Dallas, Texas. Okay. And uh, 6%. 6%. I think it's memorable. Um, I think if I were to, and, and part of that, I'll be fair, is the name. Um, if I saw this out again, I would, unless there was a stout or a porter or something like that, um, I would definitely get it. Um, it's got a full body without being terribly heavy. Um, and, and it's got a bit more of a red taste that you're not getting. Um, I guess it's got a more intense red taste than a lot of ambers do, um, which I've really enjoyed. It's exceptionally drinkable. And Mike's going to shit his pants 
because I'm going to give it a 3.2. A 3.2, okay. 3.2. Oh, you didn't. Uh, no, That's no, fantastic. I, I, I'm okay with it. I'm, I'm actually, um, I'm, a, I'm, I'm surprised it was that low for you. Yeah. So, really? Okay. Uh, I like this beer. I think it is a, a solid amber with a unique twist. Um, it's got a great mouthfeel. It's actually even a little bit creamy. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, uh, it's got a good flavor throughout. Nothing's overwhelming. In fact, it is hard to pinpoint the flavors that went into this. There's, it's, it's definitely, you know, malty. It is its own yes, experience. Exactly. It is close enough to an amber that if you handed me this and I taste it, I'd say, yeah, that's an amber L. However, it doesn't taste like every other amber L. Yeah. Um, that said. It's got a good weedy smell to it, too. It, it oh. does. Uh, yeah, in fact, when I smelled it, 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 when I smelled it, I was not like, this is the most delicious smell I've ever, I've ever smelled. But it was like, that's a good smell, and it's different. It, it smells like walking into a brewery. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, that's a good way to describe it. Amazing smell. Good way to describe it, yeah. Oh. All that said, this is a beer you have to try. This is not going to make my, like, top ten. Yeah. It is not a lizard of cause, but it's a great beer. I'm going 3.5. Three, 3.5. Five. Three, five. All right. I'll tell you that from the uh, from the the can experience, I, I always come back to. The, I think that's part of the experience of drinking a beer. This it can is, is awesome. I, I was excited about it when I got it. Uh, it poured well. It's smooth. Mm-hmm. It's it's got it's got a hoppiness to it, but the hoppiness isn't overbearing. I love it. Uh, I hadn't hadn't noticed the cream until you brought that up, but that that's got a good a good uh, good bit to it. There's a there's the bell curve to it. You know, it mm-hmm. it rises, fills your mouth. You can feel the flavors rise, and then it kind of gradually goes off. You can leave it sitting there, and you can still feel it in your mouth for mm-hmm. you know for 30, 40 seconds afterwards. Um, I'm I'm going to surprise both of you and give this uh, the highest rating of all of us. I I, sh- I, I would call this a three nine. I really Very like cool. this beer. Yeah. I really like it's this good. beer. It's good. I can't complain really about good. any of those ratings. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I really thought you were. Go- I thought Anna was going to be uh, be much higher than than she was. I, yeah. I when I tasted this, I thought this is an Anna beer. I fucking love uh, it. And I, 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 I really do. like it. I really like it. I and, do. And John, I expected you to think it was an adequate beer. I expected you to be uh, like a two eight or a two nine somewhere in there. Yeah. Uh, so you know, I was I was just wrong all the way around yeah. on this one. But well, you, you were right on picking the beer out of the fridge. So uh, yeah, yeah. This really, was a killer really beer a to start beer. with. Really a good beer. Um, you, you, you should try this. Let's play our game. Fuck date llama or who goes first? Fuck. It's okay. a, it's right there in the name. One hundred percent. Absolutely. This will get you late every time. You said 100%. This will get you late every time? Oh, oh she's saying, yeah. Uh, no, no, she's thinking, by, yeah, maybe. By, if you want to have sex with me, this will work every time. Yeah. Yeah. No, this is a great beer. Yeah. Okay, so it'll get okay. you late. I'm starting to feel worse. Like, the more I think about the beer, I'm feeling worse and worse about my rating. <laughs> <laughs> but so, I, yeah. All right, so so fuck yes. Date? Yeah, so date, uh, this this is definitely a first date beer. Uh, it is not. Yeah. It, and here's, there's two kinds of first date beers. and We've talked about the distinction. Uh, there's the first date beer when you really want to get to know the person. And there's the I'm throwing a Hail Mary, I got to surprise you and shock you. This mm-hmm. is not the second one. Right. This is the first one because it is a beer that will not overtake your conversation. You will not be sitting here talking about the beer the whole time, but it is a great beer to have well, i do think, I think it's a beer drinker's beer though yeah yes um and i do think that this would be a great beer to have as part of the first date experience where when the conversation lulls so what do you think about the beer yeah i like it there's a lot of different things to talk about it you can talk about the level of hoppiness you can talk about the the fantastic grain profile you it's got ask her if she wants to have sex now that's not beer related. Try this. Well, what is it? <laughs> Apparently to you, it hey, is. How's, how's this beer? Want to fuck? Yeah. Uh, That's actually Blaine's pickup line. Yes, so, ask, uh, ask a few times. Hey, you want another beer? The answer with this is always yes. Yeah. But you know what his problem is? <laughs> it's always uh, Michelob Ultra. Yeah, yeah. Uh. yeah. Hey, here from Michelob Ultra. Want to fuck? No. No. <laughs> I don't even want to talk. <laughs> you know? All right, so. No, fuck. I'd get drunker from water. <laughs> Fuck date lawnmower. My turn. Uh, I absolutely. I think this is a good lawnmower beer. It's a little heavy. Really, I wouldn't have expected that. It's a little heavy. But oh, I, no, it is. But, but, but I think I think it would be refreshing whenever I'm I'm out, out there. I think it would be something that I could drink while I'm I mean, out, outside mowing. I think this would be a great lawnmower beer. It's a creamy beer with a six percent. I I mean, it's your thing. I just yeah. I don't see it. I, I, but my my reasoning behind that is I think this is significantly refreshing. 
And, okay. and that, that's that's what I want when I'm mowing. It's probably a little heavy, but you know, fuck it, I'll mow your lawn. If you refreshing, me. significantly refreshing, and another uh, beer. <laughs> Mike will mow your lawn for. That's right. That's right. I want to end up mowing everybody's lawn. That is true. But you'll have lots I'll of have beer. Lots of beer. Lots of good beer. <laughs> yeah. That's okay. That is okay. All right. So we have uh, we have talked about Kennedy. We've talked about uh, the replacement. So I want to talk about why this is important a little bit and look at it historically because, you know, that's the we kind of geeky shit that I do. And something I'd like to do, and you're going to need to lead this. I, yeah. My idea, you do it, right? Okay. Um, I, I want to go. Love, I love it when you do this to me. I want to go through some key cases yeah. and just kind of imagine what if uh, Kavanaugh that's was a good point. in Aww. This is what Kavanaugh. I'm going to do is yeah. while I go through these, I'm going to go through some justices here from the past and talk about some of their their Supreme Court cases. And while we're doing it, we can uh, we, we can say, well, what do you think would happen with, with the current court? This is yeah. a breakfast beer. Breakfast beer. It tastes uh, very cereally. I don't know. I don't know. A little, maybe a little hmm. heavy for breakfast for me. but uh, Yeah, I'm not what? advocating people drink breakfast or you know drink a, beer with their cereal. You know what a good but breakfast taste, beer yeah, is? You don't need cereal. the cereal. You don't need the cereal. Just, just the beer. Just the beer. It tastes cereally. You know what a good breakfast beer is? What? Whiskey. <laughs> Scott. <laughs> Scott. <laughs> Bourbon, any kind of whiskey is okay. Any yeah. kind of whiskey is okay. Yeah, uh, it de- it depends. Are you having breakfast when you get up, or are you having breakfast before you go to sleep? Yes. If you're having breakfast before you go to sleep, I think whiskey is great. One hundred percent. Yeah. All right. So let's talk about a couple of key Supreme Court justices from the past. Um, start off with the guy that I think is the most important of these uh, Chief Justice. I'm not Chief Justice. I fucking uh, love eventually him. Eventually going to be Chief Justice John Marshall. Uh, serves from 1801 to 1835. Uh, he's going to be a Jefferson appointee, and he makes probably the most important uh, uh, Supreme Court decision that ever that's ever there. Okay, uh, John Marshall is the author of the judicial decision in the Marbury versus Madison case. Right. So I got yeah. a question. Yeah. Uh, and this is more. This is kind of a side note, but you you brought some up, made me think. So let's let's look at Obama. Right. Obama was for he was in the Senate. Right. He was Senator Obama. He was in the state Senate, and then, he, and then he went to the federal Senate, yeah. Yeah, so he was Senator Obama. So we're talk, let's talk about a law and, and an argument that Obama made. He's since been president, and that's kind of a title you carry forever. So it's 100 years from now. We're talking about an argument he made in the Senate. Would you refer to him as President Obama argued in the Senate once, or Senator Obama no. argued? No, he's president. Then Senator Obama. Yeah. Well, then, President's your title for life. So, so then it you were is. talking about Chief Justice, so he would be Chief Justice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He, okay. he, he, he is Chief Justice. But I think point. it is yeah. important when you're talking about when they made yeah. the decision to distinguish what position it was that they had at the time. Uh, that's why I think you use then Senator. Yep. Then Senator. Okay. Or cool. yeah. then Justice. I, I, I think that's probably smart. Okay. Anyway, so, sorry. John, I didn't to... John Marshall here. Uh, I, I, I like to talk about him as the most important one because he made the he most, Im- the most important decision with Marbury versus Madison by establishing judicial review. How you many tell were us on about, at the time? I think there were only three judges then. Was it three? Uh, yeah, they, they, it, 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 I don't know if people I are aware remember. of this, but the Constitution doesn't say how many justices yeah. have to be on the Supreme Court. Yeah. Uh, it gets varied from time. It's been nine since Lincoln, so it's, it's been nine for a long time. Who was it that tried to make it like thirteen? Franklin Roosevelt. Roosevelt. And we'll, we'll talk That's, a little okay. bit about that a little later on. Oh, okay. So we're talking about judicial review. Anna, you want to tell us what judicial review is, or or um... uh, judicial judicial review is essentially the idea that, um, well, when there is a dispute about whether or not a law is uh, constitutional. Um, who the fuck is going to make that decision? And it's not outlined in our Constitution. It's not. Nowhere in the Constitution does it say that the court has the right to do that. And uh, in this case, Marbury v. Madison, which I don't actually... We did a show on it. I'll link it in the, the show Marbury notes. had been appointed a judge by, by Adams. Oh, and there was that petty little squabble. That's, yeah, yeah, wait, we had and, an episode And on Jefferson it. becomes president. Madison was secretary of state and refused to swear him in. Yeah. Uh, and so, so he sues. Yeah. See, I think it's interesting that the courts actually ruled that way on that one because only, you know, one government before that, they had ruled that the person who determines whether it's constitutional or not is angry farmers with guns. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> that That's is fair. Point. That's yes. a good point. But, but why this is important is because the court took the power to rule a law unconstitutional. And today, that's really the whole purpose of the court. Yeah. You know, in, 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 in the Constitution, 
you know, the Supreme Court was just another court. Yeah, it, in it could 200 actually, and something years. Yeah, it know. could actually be a court of original jurisdiction. By the way, it still can be the court of original jurisdiction. It never will be. Yeah. But, uh, but legally it could be. So Chief Justice uh, mm-hmm. John Marshall takes this, this, sets the precedent, and every court after it is going to follow this precedent. Okay? Uh, so, Do you so, think so that could important. ever be overturned? Uh, anything can be, but I don't see. I, here's my problem: is they ha- would have to give up that that authority that they love so fucking well, much. Well, that that and and you'd have to use the precedent of your right to do this to overturn your right to do this. Right. So you know, it, it, it's kind of a weird situation there. There's a uh, reason if, why they wouldn't, and then the reason why they yeah. Here's would a question: have trouble. If they ever did overturn it, would it then overturn every constitutional appeal that's ever happened? That's no, because be, because because as a court, you can't uh, you can't invalidate a previous. You can start something there, but you can't invalidate something. Okay. So yeah. yeah anyway, yeah, because they're all equal. You're not you're not superior to a previous court. Right. So, uh, good point though. The second big case, and by the way, John Marshall was a horrible writer. A lot of a lot of your uh, constitutional scholars don't credit him as being a great uh, Supreme Court justice because his his decisions were often because. Read, read like uh, this is why because I think so, you know. It, 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 he didn't. He didn't have a whole lot of pretentious ass. He didn't have, well, well. But I'm, at the I'm same joking. time, the same. This is eighteen oh one to eighteen thirty five. There was no precedent. There wasn't a lot of precedent yeah, to quote. And I get that. Uh, but nobody will be more eloquent than Scalia ever. Oh, love Scalia, John Jiggery Marshall pokery. in uh, it, another very important case <laughs> that people forget about: Worcester versus Georgia. This is during the uh, the age of Jackson. Uh, Jackson, uh, what had happened here was gold had been found on the Cherokee Indian Reservation. There's gold in, in them in their hills. Yeah, yeah. And the state of Georgia had ordered the Indians off their land. For, for those of you at home who, who aren't really familiar with the history, just imagine he's saying oil today. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Lord. So we me. sent bombs poor, to the brown people. Poor, poor, yeah. poor, poor, poor Texas voice here. All right, so they, they, they found this oil out there, and uh, they ordered the Indians off the land with this. <laughs> Did you hear what he Shut said? Shut up. I know I say it funny. Okay. That's how I say it. Deal no, with it. You, you said they found this oil out there and o- yeah. ordered the Indians off their land. They did. And they found gold. Gold. I'm sorry. You said oil. <laughs> Listen, you got anyway, me confused now. Go ahead. Go so ahead. They found the gold. They, they, they ordered the Indians off the land. and uh, I didn't catch that. It was terrible. Terrible. And... The idea here is instead of going to war, the Cherokee Indians do the most American thing thing they can do. They sue. And here is their argument. They argue that they are not uh, – that, that the laws of the United States do not apply to them because they're an independent nation. Yeah. And people laughed at them. This is ridiculous. It goes all the way to the Supreme Court. And people expected that, that they would lose this. But here's their argument. They said – the Constitution says the Senate has the right to negotiate treaties with foreign nations. The court agreed. Then there they pulled up a treaty that the government had, 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 uh, had negotiated with the Cherokee people. And they said, since they negotiated a treaty with us, and the Constitution says they only have a right to negotiate treaties with foreign nations, we must be a foreign nation. And John Marshall agreed with him, and he said the Indians are an independent nation existing solely inside the borders of the United States, and on that reservation, the federal government has no authority. Invade. It was, it was, it was, it was, it was a brilliant decision. Now, I will say that Jackson made the famous comment here. Uh, uh, he sent the army in. They asked him, they said, how can you do that? The court has ruled against you. And he said, Marshall has made his decision. Now let him enforce it. Uh, at the time... The decision didn't stand very well, mm-hmm. but in the long run, today this has a long, long running effect on us. Yeah, this is why there that are we're still dealing with it. Well, this is why there are casinos on Indian reservations in right. states where gambling is illegal. It's because of this case. So I think it shows a degree of of respect uh, for for the law that that he that he accepted that argument. Yeah. Do you think he was right with his argument, with his position on that? Oh, was he right? Because, I mean, his options are invalidate the treaty or... Yeah, he'd have to either say the treaty was illegal or... You know, on a... They never actually operated other than just, well, we don't enforce laws here. 
Um, they've never truly operated as though those are independent nations. Yeah, so so here's the well, thing. Um, they, they do to an extent. There That's aren't little point. like cutouts in our map of like this isn't any. This isn't part of the U.S. No, nope, this isn't it, part of the it's U.S. It's largely the same thing that Israel did with the, does with the Gaza Strip and the Palestinians. That's it's, also not recognized. Well, well, largely not by Israel, but by by most of the world. It is. It, it, it's honestly, if we're going to be honest about how it's run today. It is a really nice POW camp with some perks. It's an internment camp in large, in, in, yeah. in large parts. Yeah. Like, we're not going to kill you guys. We recognize that's wrong, but still kind of fuck well, you. Well, they don't collect federal taxes there. They, they uh, don't. You're free they to don't. And, and that's all based on this, right? Yeah, yeah. But if you look at how it was run, it was like, you lost, but we're not going to kill you. I mean. Yeah, yeah. That's largely what happened here. Yeah. But I think that Marshall's interpretation of the law in this case, in my opinion, he interpreted the law correctly. Yeah. Uh, I don't know how else that you could interpret it and be true to the Constitution. But, uh, well, I don't, I don't know, right? So here's my question. If you're going to say that, that then gives this weird power to the Senate. If they negotiate a treaty with this household, I become a foreign nation. Now, where did they get the ability to make me a foreign nation? Well, we have the Senate has the power in the Constitution to recognize uh, re- recognize nation, to recognize ambassadors. Yeah. Yes, that is that's a Senate thing. power. They have the power to recognize them, but not make them. There's well, a difference. No, I think I don't think there is. I think they are recognizing it. They're saying that this is an independent nation that lives there. We've we've had a treaty with them. We passed the treaty. We're recognizing them. I I, I think it is the same thing. Now, here's my thing. Yeah, but, I because think, treaties aren't. Uh, they're not making new nations, new countries, whenever they they are recognizing them whenever they enter into a treaty with them. I think that Marshall was right. Here's what I think the problem is. I think that it wasn't enforced by the government correctly afterwards. Yeah. So, I mean, so here's the thing. If you ever get a big enough group to make enough trouble with the government, make a bunch of trouble, when they want to bring in the big guns, say, hey, it's going to cost you like a lot of people and a lot of money... We're willing to sign a treaty with you, though. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I, and now I, you get to be an independent nation, uh, and then you got to go to the court and and see if it if it if it holds up. Yeah, you know. Uh, and current court. I mean, good fucking luck. I'm a little curious. What do you think the current court would do in this case? I don't think they recognize it, and I don't think they do I don't either. think you'd get that far. I don't think they do. I think Kennedy probably would have recognized it. It sounds like the kind of thing, thing that he would look at, uh, the, the, the mindset he had of, of reading the, the, the document for what it says. Uh, even if he disagreed, I think he would have been one that voted for this. Yeah, it would um, have been a 5-4 decision. Probably, probably. He'd, he, and he'd have written the dissenting opinion explaining uh-huh. why. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, I, think, I think Kavanaugh would be different probably. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Next guy I want to talk about is Charles Evans Hughes. Uh, Charles Evans Hughes is an interesting case. Uh, by the way, uh, Charles Evans Hughes is the guy that the that the picture on the Monopoly game, the Monopoly guy, is based after. If you oh, want to know what he, what he looks know like, that. yeah. Uh, Charles Evans Hughes was an He's associate justice fish. from 1910 to 1916. Okay, so six years as an associate justice. Uh, he then leaves. He becomes the Republican governor of New York. Uh, tries to get the Republican nomination for president. Fails and is is appointed by Herbert Hoover as Chief Justice again mm-hmm. from 1930 to 1941. Mm-hmm. So that's an interesting way to do things. Mm-hmm. He was effective as an Associate Justice. Mm-hmm. So Herbert Hoover says he was so good. Let's bring him back and make him uh, Chief Justice. Mm-hmm. Um, Thank you. Uh, he had served as Warren Harding Secretary of State. He's he's somebody that that's been in a been in a lot of interesting political positions. But Thank what I you. find most interesting about Charles Evans Hughes is this is the guy that struck down Franklin Roosevelt's overreach in the National mm-hmm. Recovery Act. He said Roosevelt cannot negotiate can negotiate for the government with businesses as the National Recovery Act because they are de facto taking the legislative branch's powers uh, and, and threw the NRA out, threw a lot of Roosevelt's New Deal stuff out. The result of that was Roosevelt goes to war with the court that we talked about earlier. Franklin Roosevelt, with his famous court reform plan, or what we call the court packing plan, mm-hmm. tried to raise the number of court uh, Because of, of it judges lost. Up we to call 13. it the court packing plan. Yeah, yeah, the court packing plan. Well, it kind of lost. Uh, well. Our history books always say that Roosevelt made his one overreach here by trying to pack the court because he lost, and he did. But he scared the crap out of the court so bad that 
a lot of the court members, guys like Van Devanter, they started voting more progressive and voting with him. Yeah. And he ended up getting four appointees by the end of his term, and he ended up getting control of the court anyway. Right. Just by scaring the shit out of him by doing this. Uh, I honestly don't think Roosevelt ever thought he was going to get away with the court packing plan. I think that was like his nuclear option. Yeah. Look, either you cooperate or I'm going to try this again. Yeah, do it or I'm going to fuck you up. Uh, but I, I find it interesting that uh, that this is this is the guy that, that fought FDR. He was willing to take on Franklin Roosevelt. I want to give him a high five. Um, it, that, that, that's pretty, pretty amazing to me. Um, do you think the current court could, would, would, would take on a, a, a popular president? I mean, Roosevelt was a four-term president. Do you think they would take, take on somebody like that? Uh, we have current? Well, the current, or even we can go back to Obama. Uh, we, I, I can't think of a time when the no, court... No, I meant current court. Yeah, the current court. Because I was, I was, I was yeah, looking at court. it thinking with Kavanaugh on well, with it. Kavanaugh, but yeah, you're or, or, or with Kavanaugh, either way. Kavanaugh is a one-vote vote decision. Uh, and, and it, you know, I think it would have been... 4-4 four, four with Kennedy making a decision before this. Now you've got Kavanaugh coming in. Making I, 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 think, I think with Kavanaugh in, there's no way you take on the court or, or take on the president. I think the conservatives, with, with Trump in power, there's no way they do this. Yeah, with Trump in power. But, I mean, switch that to a Democrat and uh, the votes flip. Yeah, I think so. I think so. Which is uh, a problem with partisan judges. Which is a problem. Very, good point. Good point. Uh, how about Earl Warren? He, he made the popcorn, right? Shut up. The Warren Court yeah, is the... Jobs. Flow jobs. okay. The Warren Court is the one that, 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 that I remember probably learning the most about when I was in school. He was... Uh, because in, in the modern era, he's, he, he was the most active of the courts. This guy's chief justice from 1953 to 1969, okay? Comes in as chief justice. Never serves an, as an associate. Um, which Big is dog. kind of unusual. He had served as governor of California. Now, here's what's interesting. He was the governor of California that opened the internment camps for the Japanese. Mm -hmm. And he gets appointed to the Supreme Court. Yeah. That seems dangerous. You, you mentioned he comes in as chief justice. How is a chief justice made? When the chief justice retires, the president appoints him. It's, that, so it, it it's, it's a spot in the court. It's just a spot. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's not like a, it's not the senior judge. You could spend your whole life as an associate justice. Been in there twenty years. The chief justice retires. They can appoint somebody that's never been on the court. So but normally, the do they is traditionally the practice has been to move someone up and then fill the position. But in the last thirty or forty years, that's not happened. Okay, interesting. Uh, yeah. Now they just almost always consider it just another position, and they just fill it. Um, it's not very nice. I don't know if it is or it's not. Fine. Uh, it it, it it's a way to change the whole makeup of the court very quickly. Yeah. Uh, again, because this person gets to make the appointments. Um, what I'm hearing is presidents praying that the uh, chief justice dies or retires. Yeah, yeah. Uh, here's what I find interesting: is uh, everybody again expected Earl Warren to be a super conservative. He terrified the, the liberals whenever he was becoming... Because, again, this is the guy that interred the Japanese. Right. Uh, he was actually running for president uh, uh, against Eisenhower for the Republican nomination and withdrew, backed Eisenhower, and then Eisenhower won and appointed him to the court. Mm -hmm. So you kind of wonder about that. But, uh, but he gets appointed to the court, and this is the guy that made some, some pretty interesting decisions. Um, a guy that was expected to be uber conservative, and he's the one that makes the decision in the Brown versus Board of Education Topeka, Kansas case in '54. Uh, that's the quick the case that uh, that legally ended segregation nationwide. Right. You know, uh, he he voted and he voted and led the court in saying segregation is discrimination and therefore illegal. The same guy that interred Japanese because they were Japanese. Wartime. I bet that was his... <coughs> it was. Um, he's also the person that, that, that led... In well, and, and I think it's important to, to point out that Japanese isn't so much a race as it is a nationality. It is, and a culture. Yeah. And a culture, yeah. Uh, uh, and I can see someone seeing a difference there. I don't think the average American saw the difference. I don't, I don't either, but we're not, we're not talking about the average American, if, if we're going to be honest. And I don't see that distinction so well myself, but I could see yeah. a, a genuine argument there. Yeah, I, I, I don't think that argument would hold at this time period. I really don't. I think, uh, I think it's, it, it, it's more of a case of uh, 
in times of war, Earl Warren was willing to do drastic things that he would never be willing to do at other times. Yeah. And surprise people. Uh, because, again, he, he, he seems to be very passionate about this, about the rights of individuals. He's also the guy that's chief justice when the Miranda case comes up, Miranda versus mm-hmm. Arizona, which is where we get our Miranda rights from, mm-hmm. that, that you have the right to remain silent, that you have the right to an attorney. He's the guy that comes through and says, no, if the indigent cannot afford an attorney, the government has to provide one to them. And I think most of us think that the Miranda rights are, are a good thing, right? Yeah. I like small government, but that is a concession I am more than willing to make. That was in 1966. Like, let the anarchists hang me. I'm more than willing to make that concession. Which concession? Uh, in lawyers for people who can't that afford the government. Them. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm with you. I'm with you. I mean, yeah, it costs state money, and and it's it's a welfare, but it's 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 a welfare against the government itself. It, it, it's like saying, um, I'm trying to I'm trying to think of another good analogy. Anyway, it, it's it's your defense against the power. So yeah, anyway, yeah. We're, we're getting on a tangent. Yeah, that's a whole discussion that yeah. can happen. That shouldn't right now. Yeah. Well, again, this is a pretty pretty big decision here. The Loving case, Loving versus Virginia, nineteen sixty seven. Beautiful case. It, uh, we we had Loving Day what a month ago. Well, it, longer than that. The Loving versus maybe? Virginia yeah. case. Uh, in 1967, this comes, came out where it was illegal to have interracial marriages in mm-hmm. Virginia. And he came through uh, with his court and said, you cannot do that. You cannot prevent people from, from marrying based on race. Well, and it's I love the name, like how it all ties in. Yeah, yeah. Uh, which I, I think is why they picked that one to test the court with. I mean, oh. there, there's a reason oh, yeah. why you why you pick cases. Yeah, there was Rosa Parks. Yeah, yeah, versus the other lady whose name we never remember. Yeah, because because she, she was all pregnant, pregnant and poor, yeah, young yeah. and poor, uh, not photogenic. Yeah, right. But th- this this loving case is amazing to me uh, b- because they go through and they say, look, the Constitution says that that you know the fourteenth they're, they're applying the fourteenth amendment here. They're saying mm-hmm. you cannot uh, uh, apply the Constitution unequally based on races. Therefore, you cannot hear. Yeah. Uh, and I, I, you know, while while I think the Fourteenth Amendment has been greatly uh, abused in a lot of cases, I think in this case they were right. Yeah. Uh, I don't want to really look at these in the modern court because they're 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 cases of their time period. Mm-hmm. I don't think the modern court you could even even look at this and and, and make a right. make a good judgment. Uh, William Brennan, another associate justice from fifty six to nineteen ninety. Mm-hmm. 1956 to 1990. That's a long time to be on the court. Uh, This guy comes through here, and and he writes the decision in Baker versus Carr in 1962. This was his big, big case. But why is this one going to be important? This one deals with reapportionment. This is the one man, one vote law. Oh, yeah. It goes through it. He says that you cannot... Uh, you cannot draw your electoral districts in order to disenfranchise people, and it allowed the federal government to get in and interfere with a state's apportionment. And has been challenged a lot it's here been recently. Challenged a lot. Uh, so far, it's lost every time, uh, but but it but it's been challenged quite a bit uh, with the idea. And I, I've got some issues with this. Uh, I agree with the principle. That your districts should be should should be drawn uh, fairly, and they shouldn't take race into consideration. But the other side of that is, I also agree that states have a right to draw their districts, and this allows the federal government to come in and redraw election districts. What do you think the modern court would do with this? I think absolutely, particularly oh, they would redraw districts particularly, all goddamn particularly day. with the the, the new uh, uh, justices that have come in. I think they would very much allow the federal government to redraw electoral. One hundred percent, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I'm, I'm really. I wouldn't be surprised. If, yeah, go ahead. yeah. I, I wouldn't be surprised if they found some way in which it was a federal job to do anyway. Yeah, and just completely took it over. Wow, you, I mean, totally. That, that's where I was going to go with that. Actually, that one shocked me. Yeah, I, I fully expect that in my lifetime, which is shorter than your lifetime, left. In my lifetime, we're going to see an independent agency uh, put responsible for the apportionment. Of independent. independent. Yeah. That's cute. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Is it going to be like the debates? It'll yes, be like yes. the Fed. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but I, I, I figure that's going to happen. A bit. I call it bipartisan, which uh, is not independent. So uh, is not Oliver bipartisan. Wendell Holmes, by the, one of the greatest names ever of a, of a judge, 
Associate Justice, 1902 to 1932, one of the most prolific writers of our of our judges. Incredible writer. Uh, he's the one that famously said, when asked about pornography, said, uh, uh, "I know it when I see yeah, it." I, I don't. I don't know the definition, but I know it when I see it. Um, he's. A, I also have a definition, though. <laughs> see, I, I think there should have been a test. Like, if you find it really hard to masturbate to, probably not porn. <laughs> If it's dial-up, it's not yeah, It's not porn. Exactly. It takes too long. Exactly. Damn. So Theodore Excellent. Roosevelt appoints this guy. And while he made hundreds of, of amazing Slow decisions, the case I want to talk about is, is, is Schenck versus United States. Uh, this is the guy that was, uh, that was actively protesting against the, uh, the draft. And he ends up getting arrested for it. And... Uh, in this case, Oliver Wendell Wasn't Holmes... Wasn't the burn your draft card guy. Yes. Yep. It was? This oh, is, okay. Uh, this is the case. Oliver Wendell Holmes said that his speech could be limited because oh, right. of the clear and present danger doctrine. He said that if your speech provides a clear and present danger to the populace or a clear and present danger to the state, that it could be limited. I think he was wrong here. Yeah. Uh, but by far. Later on... He's going to reverse himself, and he's going to go, going to point out in several cases that this has been completely abused and regret having made Fucking that Fucking shocker. Maybe you should have reconsidered uh, that before you wrote it. But but the clear and present danger doctrine is genu- genuine, ah, generally considered to be the doctrine that the court uses today. Well, and I guess that's uh, kind of jumping here, but I guess that's one of... Um, the concerns that I see with highly partisan appointees um, is the idea that when they are more motivated by uh, partisan politics than they are by, uh, by principle and the philosophy of determining constitutionality, um, I think what you end up with is decisions written in such a way that the impact of them later when power changes hands is less than effectively considered. Well, and, and with Kavanaugh here, I uh, uh, wonder, you know, the, the original ruling was clear and present danger, but looking at his stuff on mass data collection and other stuff, I wonder if he wouldn't have said, clear what is... and maybe danger. What is speech? Speech. Is yeah. that, is that <laughs> yeah. in? I can't really... No, I don't know. I don't think it's here. Yeah, yeah. I, it, would be, it would be an interesting way to see it. Uh, but the clear and present danger... You, you, Holmes is going to later on say that people fundamentally misunderstood it. Okay? Because fundamentally he was saying that... Well, well I'm going to take him at his word. Fine. Because he is going to say over and over and, and, and limit the court because he kept telling people, look, I said that it has to clearly and presently lead to a dangerous or illegal action. And all you heard was clear. You didn't hear the present. So he, his statement was, look, this guy that was fighting the draft was leading to a possibility of an invasion. That was a present danger. Later on, when, when the court, li- court says, well, this clearly leads to, to riots down the road, he, says, he would say, yeah, but it's not present. It's not something that's happening now. Well, well and, and that's exactly where I would yeah. I would disagree with with his ruling there is that it wasn't a present danger. Well, and, I don't and know. I, I I think in World War One, uh, I, I I think it was. Now that having, I would I would well, not make the how ruling. How present he did. is he talking though? Because well, it sounds like we were in his fighting excuses, a war against the, I get against the that. country, so it was definitely present. Within a couple I, days, within a month, yeah, a year, that's what I'm yeah. saying. Yeah. Present, but, like. But, you know, what people won't realize... You if know, you what, burned what, your draft card on, on block one, by the time you got to block two, were we going to be seeing an invasion? Yeah, I Was it going to be an hour later, a day later? Yeah, I, I, I understand your issue. I, I, while I disagree with the, the ruling, I think that if you interpret it the way he meant to, it kind of makes sense. And I see how it got abused. Here, here's my... But he, it definitely did. But let's give him credit. He tried to fix it. He said, "You and were I can not. Appreciate that. You were not do, using this the way I said to." So, so here's my big issue. He said, "Clear and present danger," and and when he kind of outlined the the fire in a crowded building, I have I'm fine with clear and dan- and present danger to human life. I'm actually fine with that ruling, but he went a step further. 
to people or the state. And when you talk about or yeah, the because, state... Because you said, yeah. said lead to, to a, an illegal action. Yeah. yeah. So when you talk about the state, I mean, talking about the state could be voting in a way that would completely reshape the state. That could be a danger to the state. But it's not leading to, leading to a dangerous or illegal action. Well, I guess dangerous. Depends on maybe. what the law is. Yeah. It really depends on what the law yeah. is. Okay. Okay. I can see what you're saying. So I, I, again, I think I think Holmes made made a lot of sense here in the time period, and I think his but but I think his case was, I think his interpretation was greatly abused, and let, let, let's at least give him credit for 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 recognizing that in his own life. And, and I, he ended up being he ended up being a, a first freedoms guy later on, where he, he he came he's the guy that came back and said no I was wrong, the First Amendment has a preferred position over all the others because it because it came first. Yeah. And, and I can respect that. I mean, yeah. I can. Um, I'm not going to go into, into yeah. internal politics, but I, we recently saw yeah. that. I was a, I, I'm kind of a fan of Holmes in a lot of ways. Uh, and, and part of the reason why is because he was able to say, I, I fucked up. Can we make shirts that say Holmes is my homie? <laughs> uh, next guy. This guy had to be a Supreme Court justice, okay? John Marshall Harlan. He's named after Chief Justice John Marshall. Right. Uh, he comes up, becomes chief, uh, becomes uh, an associate justice in 1877, uh, serves from 1877 to 1911. This is why I like John Marshall Harlan. He was born to a slave-holding family, I think in Kentucky, a slave-holding family. And yet, in his own lifetime, when the Plessy versus Ferguson case comes up in 1896, the famous separate but equal, he cast the sole dissenting opinion and said, no, blacks are people. And I can respect that. There's a comma there that changes that whole sentence. Oh, John. I'm just saying. Like, so. Uh, but it, it kind of, yeah, yeah, okay, fine. <laughs> but it's, it's kind, of a, kind of an amazing thing. Uh, I will say later on, I've got some issues. He, he expands the 14th Amendment further than, he, than any uh, Supreme Court justice ever did. Uh, starts applying it to, to he's the guy that, that, that puts pins the decision that applies the 14th Amendment to the states. Mm-hmm. But uh, but just the fact that when Plessy versus Ferguson passes on a nine man judge, he's the sole person that says no, no, you're wrong, yeah. you're wrong. Blacks are people. Yeah. Um, kind kind of an interesting thing. Um, last one I want to talk about. I, I was going to talk about Hugo Black, but I'm going to skip him. I'm going to go on to Joseph Story. Uh, Joseph Story serves from 1812 to 1845. Uh, he was only 32 years old when he was appointed Supreme Court Justice. Hmm. Can you imagine appointing a 32-year-old Supreme Court today? That's, that's that yeah. seems seems kind of kind of. I'm game, guys. Hey, <laughs> Trump, uh, give it a shot. Me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, why? I, what why I like about this guy? He does two things. One of them I don't like, and one of them I really do. First one is in the case of the Bank of the United States versus Dandridge. This is way back in 1827. This guy is the person that outlines the law that begins to recognize corporations as legal entities Mm -hmm. and later on as individuals. They're going to quote Joseph Story's decision. Uh, So the modern understanding of a corporation, this is the guy that came up with it. Okay? Got some problems with that. Uh, But... On the Amistad case, y'all, y'all know the story of the Amistad. It was a, uh, this is way back in 1841. The Amistad was a slave ship. They, uh, the slaves rose up. They overthrew the, the, the owners. Uh, had a big, big old slave revolt. Well, they get captured and they end up going to court. And John Quincy Adams, the former president, uh, is, is the, the, the de- defendant for the slaves. Because he had to do something. Uh, well, he was an incredible former president, terrible president. Uh, but he rules in the Amistad case that uh, that that it was that that these slaves had rights, and the transportation of slaves across the Atlantic Ocean was an illegal action. Therefore, these slaves should be set free. Hmm. Uh, pretty amazing decision when you think about it. It's 1841. Okay, yeah. now the transatlantic slave trade had been been illegal since 1800. Right. But slavery was still the law of the land. Yeah. And this guy says, to "Screw you! To hell with that! They're people. They're yeah. free." Uh, so, it's almost like he, you know, was a fucking person. Yeah, yeah. What? But, but but again, we have a hard time putting ourselves in that time period. I, I know, uh, I know. Yeah. Uh, I, it would you know, be very difficult to be be that person. You know, but but I, you say that, but I feel like you know we kind of put ourselves in that time period. So I can remember, and this is geographic to some extent, but so was the slave trade. Uh, living in Texas 
and it, it just being if if you mentioned being gay or or anything like you know you just automatically a terrible fucking person yeah right yeah. automatically yeah that was Tuesday yeah exactly and and I can kind of put you know honestly they're not being enslaved but I can put myself in the shoes and say you know. I can look around and say, what the fuck is your guy's problem here? Yeah, yeah. You know? And so I, I think we can and we can't, and I think we normalize it even. Even as people who don't agree with that, we sit there and, and somebody will say something, we're like... Ah. Every time you say, that's grandpa, that's when he grew up. Yeah, that's yeah, grandpa, that's, that's when he grew, he grew up, up or you say, eh, he's a coworker. I don't know if I'll, you know, I'm going to let it go. But I, I get that. I do get that. And on the other hand, I, I want to say there's a difference in getting it and saying, I'm not going to do a thing, and saying, I'm going to be that person. Right? Yeah. So I, I think we kind of get it and we kind of don't. Does that make Yeah, I, I, I think it would be very hard at that time period to be that person. Uh, but, but it's one of those cases where I look at it and I go, I, I, I hope that in this case I would be that person. If I could be just but, dropped in. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, into but, that person's but, shoes. But if you were raised in that, would you would you be the person you are? Well, and, right. and you look around and you see them hanging people, and you're like, uh, my neck's not that stretchy and shit. So, <laughs> I'm okay with hanging people. I'm just not okay with hanging them because of their race. But, no, I know. But if <laughs> well, you be beca- going to a place, but but so you see people being hung for their race. Yeah, hanged. Hanged. Whatever. And we'll you, hanged you for that. <laughs> <laughs> and 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 you're going to be the big advocate for their rights. It's like, will they stop just because I'm nice. white? Yes, yeah, like, yeah. will I? No, I, you'll yeah. actually get a trial though. Well, and, true. And then you'll be hanged. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So that kind of takes me through the, uh, the, the 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 kind of the background. And again, the reason I wanted to talk about these is to kind of show people why it's important. Why do we need to care about who the the justices are? Uh, by the way, I don't know if you've seen the news or not, but uh, Chuck Schumer uh, is has, was out yesterday. I think it was yesterday, maybe been Friday. I think it was Friday actually. Uh, was out talking about how uh, the Democrats were going to block the uh, approval of of of, uh, of this until, until 2020, until right? The, well, until the midterms in, in, in 18. Uh, so you know. It won't be that long to the midterm. I'm just saying, it is so but, close to the next presidential election, it would be unreasonable for them to allow yeah, him to appoint somebody right now. Yeah, uh, that, 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 that's the logic here. <laughs> uh, and, and the thing is, you know, maybe it could happen because the, the, the Republicans have a very tenuous grip. It's what, 51-49 right so now? That's strange. Weren't the uh, Democrats 51 and, and, and a few of those Republicans, you, you can't, you know, you don't know where they're going to go. You know, uh, you you got guys like uh, John McCain there. You don't know what the hell he's going to do. So he neither uh, does he. Yeah, he, Alzheimer's kicked in. So that it's interesting mean, interesting to me. Uh, uh, while he said that the the Republicans uh, our Republican leadership is saying that the the vote will be by by the end of August. So we'll we'll see. We will yeah. see. Um, and in the meantime, after the thirty first, we have eight justices and well and and, and you can function with eight. So you I can until it's a four four vote. In which no, case, well, it I mean, fails. It fails. Well, I mean, yeah. I get that, yeah. but so they don't like it. I, I thought it was interesting having seen this history here. I, I heard his his, uh, I don't know what the right term is, but his speech from Trump's appointment, right? It's yeah. not acceptance speech because he doesn't have it yet. Yeah, but it's his, his gee, thanks for the consideration. Yeah, speech. Um, and he talked really. He talked a lot, and I understand why now. About it's not about partisanship; it's about ruling mm-hmm. fairly. Um, do you think we have a partisan justice coming up? I think we do. Uh, uh, but, but again, it, it's so hard to predict what they're going to do when they get there. Up, there's, there's just case after case of judges that we expect to do one thing. They get there and they, they surprise the hell out of us. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, I, I think about a quote from Kennedy. Uh, Kennedy hated to be called the swing vote. Uh, he said one time that, that he liked to be called the swinger vote. You know, he, he, he said, he said one time that, that, that I don't swing the issues to. And I think he's kind of got a, got, a, got, a, got a point there with mm-hmm. his stuff, uh, mm-hmm. you know. And uh, it, it's just real hard to predict. It's yeah. real yeah. hard to predict. So, All right. Uh, a little terrifying to me. It wouldn't be my choice. We will be keeping our eyes and ears open at Six Pack Philosophy. Who would be your choice? I don't know. Uh, me. 
Me, me, yeah, me. What about you, John? I no, I don't want two John. options. I don't want John on the court. Um, I would be. I would pick Blaine. Um, no, 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 Blaine. No. <laughs> no. Uh, 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 Judge Jim Gray. Not a bad choice. Actually. Neil deGrasse Tyson. Neil deGrasse Tyson. He's an expert on everything. Fuck Andy G. I know you can't state him, and I love him. So, all right, uh, this was fun, guys. It was. Uh, if you like this show, you can support us on Patreon by going to patreon.com slash sixpackphilosophy. Get some cool swag. Uh, you can find us on um, Teespring, where you can get our swag. And uh, that is teespring.com and search Six Pack Philosophy. We're all over there with some cool, fun stuff and more cool, fun stuff coming soon. Um, hit us up on our website at sixpackphilosophy.com where you can join our website and get, theoretically, newsletters every Friday. Um, we are That's also, a big theory. <laughs> we are also on social media. Just You'll get search. newsletters eventually. Ish. <laughs> I'm going to get better at that. Um, you can get... Damn it, John. <laughs> I got excited. I got excited. Sorry. Uh, you can find us on social media and just by searching Six Pack Philosophy. If we're not there, let us know that you want us to be there. If you find a podcast platform that we're not on that you think is amazing and that we should be on, let us know and we will work our podcast magic and get on there too. And I'm going to see how much longer I can drag this thing out to oh irritate the guys. Cheers. Six Pack Philosophy is supported by independent philosophers just like you. If you would like to support us, go to sixpackphilosophy.com and don't forget to like, share, and subscribe.